Tune into this week's on .NET, where I have my best friend Sergio on talking about the .NET community toolkit. This thing is going to blow your mind. It's got MVVM goodness, high performance goodness, and diagnostics too. So tune in. Welcome back, everyone, to another On.NET. I am your host, James Montemagno, and today I am crazy excited because we're talking about this brand new open source project called the .NET Community Toolkit. My good friend Sergio on is going to talk all about it, and I'm real excited because I actually did a deep dive video on my YouTube, which I'll put up over there or down there, on source generators, which is just like a tiny little fraction of what is in this amazing toolkit for developers building any application for any platform at all with C Sharp and .NET. I'm crazy excited. Now, before we get started, don't forget, if you're over on the YouTubes, jam that like button, hit that subscribe so you get all of the notifications wherever we put out new videos. But let's get into it. How's it going, Sergio? Hey, thank you for having me. Yeah, and as always, um, because, um, you know, I'd speak, um, all, I can't even pronounce my own, own name <laughs> properly in Italian. I can't right. pronounce your name, Sergio. Sir, yeah. Sir, Sergio, Sergio, it's Sergio. fine. <laughs> Either way, uh, I'm, I'm good with <laughs> I was talking, I took French for like so many years and I could never roll my R's and my French instructor was just like, just give up. And then I did, yeah. and I just gave up pretty much. <laughs> and that was it. So uh, um, now this is gonna be your first time on on.net. And I know that you presented at .net right. conf, but maybe uh, before we get into it, who are you? What do you do here at Microsoft? Sure. So I'm Sergio Pedri. I'm a software engineer too at Microsoft. I'm in the Windows Microsoft store actually. Um, client team. So I primarily work on the client app. And I also own and maintain the .NET Community Toolkit, which is this new toolkit we're presenting today. So I kind of spend my time half working on the store, or primarily working on the store, and then helping out in the toolkit, and then also spending time figuring out how to share components back from the store to the toolkit, and then vice versa. So we were trying to be to open source components as we can, so to also help the whole community, which is cool. Like. I'm really enjoying doing that. <laughs> Very cool. So this is the store app on like Windows. When I go to the store, the new one yep, that's like all that's super correct. beautiful and amazing. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Glad to hear Very, that. Very. Oh, I love it. I I think I've honestly. I mean, my own apps are in the store too. So I appreciate that my apps actually look you know super that? beautiful in there. Yeah, I got. I, I'm. I've been. You know, I've been a Windows app developer for. Oh my goodness, forever at this point. But yeah, I've had. I've I've had the whole journey. As soon as there was a store, <laughs> I put it in the store. Um, so, okay, yep. now I know that there's like all these toolkits out there, right? There's right. there's actually been like a Xamarin community toolkit. There was a, a Donna Maui community toolkit. I Correct. used to use like the, the Windows phone and Silverlight and WPF community <laughs> toolkits. There's like, they used to be on code for fun and all this stuff. What is <laughs> what is this .NET community toolkit? Is there like a history here? Like, is it new? Is. Like what's, yeah. what, what's going on here? <laughs> so the project kind of started out a couple of years ago. Uh, and originally branched off from the Windows Community Toolkit, which is this, which is this toolkit that contains a whole bunch of libraries and controls and helpers, primarily for EWP developers. It started out almost six years ago, hmm. and so a couple of years ago, I started talking with Michael Oker, which is the owner of the Windows Community Toolkit, and I kind of pitched a couple of ideas regarding more .NET-oriented APIs because the toolkit kind of already contained a lot of useful APIs for UWP devs, but I figured there was also a space where we could expand to tailor to .NET developers on all platforms, both the ones actually building apps using UWP, WPF, Maui, Blazor, or what have you, Uno, uh, Xamarin, and all that, but also like mostly backend developers, for instance, because we, are, we also have, we wanted to have helpers and APIs that could help in all kinds of scenarios. And so the first thing that we, added was the high performance package, which is a collection of like APIs primarily meant for high performance. So it uh, contains stuff such as the helpers for working with like pooling arrays, uh, working with multidimensional arrays in an efficient manner, uh, APIs for pooling and reusing string instances and things like that. And then from there, we also added the diagnostics package, which contains a whole bunch of extensions to make it easier to validate arguments and throwing exceptions into applications, which is something that's particularly verbose and also error prone and kind of just annoying, like feels like a chore to do. So we figure uh, we might try something to help out in that space as well. And then after that, um, I had this idea to had 
a couple of initially just a couple of APIs to help with MVVM because the issue was that there were a number of other libraries that already did MVVM, such as Prism or MVVM Cross. And then there was also, of course, MVVM Lite. But the issue with that is that MVVM Lite was no longer really maintained. Like the last update was from a few years ago, and it also had a couple dependencies specifically for like WBF and all that. Mm -hmm. And and also like there's this not really an issue, but if you start with a project and then keep maintaining it over the years, of course, you you're going to keep holding on to design decisions that might no longer apply at this point, it's like even just because of maybe new technologies that are better have come up, so like yeah. source generators, for instance. And so we figured we might take that occasion to come up with a new set of APIs to help with MVVM. And the idea was not to go into direct competition with like Prism or MVVM Cross, but just to provide a set of, um, we say, reference implementations for like interfaces and types that are already in the BCL, such as mm -hmm. I command, I notify property changes and whatnot. And then basically to offer something that was easy to use, flexible, modular, a la carte, and not tied to any specific framework. And so that's how the MVVM toolkit uh, came to life. Uh, we kept, uh, we've kept working on it ever since. It's getting a lot of traction. So I'm really happy about how that's going. So, that's really yeah. that's really cool, and and this is the one that I focus on in my YouTube video, which I'll put a link to for like kind of walk through before and after, and we're going to show off all the good stuff. Because when I first saw it, it blew my mind, and I know I've had a <laughs> library out for many many years. It has like millions of downloads on NuGet, which is the MVVM Helpers Library, yep. and the whole idea that I had was very similar, which was there's a bunch of stuff that I want to not copy and paste around from all my different projects when I'm doing stuff like, oh, I just want to have a base view model or I want to have an observable object or I just want to have some optimized observable right. collections. And I was it, was it was all code that I would copy around and I put it in a library. And the idea was it has zero dependencies, right? It's, right. Not, a, it's not a framework, <laughs> right? Um, which is important. Like if you love Prism and you love everything, like go use those frameworks that you love. Yep. But if you're just like, hey, I want to get started, like this is the uh, a, a blank slate that you can yep. you can use when you want to for certain occasions. If, and if that's great for your app, awesome. If you need something more structured, then there's great libraries out there. And it sounds like that's the same spirit that this yes. that all three of the packages have, right? Because yeah, they can be right, used yeah. anywhere with anything. Yes. And like they're they're meant to be independent, modular, and like even just within themselves, we took care to, for instance, in the MVM toolkit, where we have all the various components that can also be used independently from each other. That's mm -hmm. kind of one of the main, not really an issue. I mean, I guess for libraries such as Prism and MVVM Cross, one of the points is that you need to go all in, right? You need, you, and in return, you get a whole bunch of benefits such as like bootstrapping and then you get this whole architecture for your app. But mm -hmm. there might be scenarios where you might just want to use like just commands or like just observable objects. And it's kind of hard in those cases to just pick the things that you want to use and then just gradually implement more of that over time. And so instead, this is the approach we took, which yes, that's some reasonable to what you did as well. Yeah, that's very cool. Well, I'm really excited because I think I've had a lot of people ever since I did my video were like, well, what about your library? And I said, throw away my library. Like this is everything you need. Um, well, cause I'm, I'm all in and I want to talk about all three packages. Cause like I said, I've only really touched MVVM, but I want right. to kind of hear it from your mouth since you and the team <laughs> and the community implemented it. Like what are all the different parts of it and and what it actually means for developers because you said something really important which was that specific library uses source generators which is Correct. a very different approach than what i took or what other libraries out there use maybe something like fody for example that does il weaving yep. i also got questions about that so i would love to deep dive if you uh want to have a of demo ready for us you want to <laughs> do it i have let me just share my screen over here so this is the MVVM Toolkit sample app, which basically just gives you an overview of all the docs that we have and also includes a couple of interactive samples that you can go over. And so basically, here you can see all the various components. We have observable object, observable validator, and which are the main component model base classes that your view models can inherit from. Then we have commands. We have both synchronous and asynchronous commands. So this would be the reference implementation for the I command interface from the BCL. 
Then we have a messenger, which is kind of similar to uh, you might find in Prism, for instance, they have an event aggregator or like um, MVM Lite had this messenger type as well, which is a component that helps you to broadcast messages in a loosely coupled fashion across different modules of your application. So for instance, you might imagine you have a module of your application where the user might log in, for instance. Then you want to broadcast the fact that this user has logged in to another component in your application that might refresh or load some additional data after mm. that. So this is this can be used for that. And then we also have some basic APIs to just help with uh, people doing dependency injection and using the service locator pattern. And so the currently, as of the 8.0 version that um, is currently out in preview, we basically have these two different approaches. So the, the design decision we took with source generators was not to force developers into necessarily having to use them just because mm -hmm. they're like new and out right now. So we basically wanted to do exactly the same that we did initially, which is just letting everyone pick and choose the individual components that they wanted to use. And so you still have all these basic components that you expect. And then on top of that, you can also do many of the same things, but through source generators. So for instance, you might uh, inherit from observable object and then implement a property normally, like with the set property helper method, or you can just do this uh, by using, you can see that here, observable property and then letting the source generator do everything for you like you showed in your video. Okay, so, okay. So, yep. so let's back it up here a little bit. So what you're saying is the normal observable object, like in general that you have, yep. is just like a base implementation that gives you some helper methods under the hood, like, you know, that, like the set property. So many Correct. developers are gonna be used to this, right? Which is this private mm -hmm. string name, I create my public field, and then I do a get and a set. But what you're saying is you can still do that. Yes. Um, or you can use these attributes on top of the code, correct? Correct. Yes. You have both options at your disposal, and then you can just you can just choose depending on your preference, your style, or any other reason. Yes. So when you do those properties, what is it actually doing? Right? If you go back to those properties that you have there. Sorry, where? Oh, for the for the <laughs> the observable property that you show. Oh, yes, right. So it basically generates the same thing. I can actually show you the the code that's generated. So I have the sample app here. And you can see here that I have a whole bunch of observable properties here that also have validation. All right, let's make and that so, a little bit bigger really quick, really oops. quick. 160. Perfect. Awesome. Right. Okay. So so there's a what these are all those, those observable properties required min length, max length. Correct. Those are both this. A validator and also just making it observable, correct? Yes, I'm combining both the observable property and a bunch of validation attributes. So I want mm -hmm. to set up a couple of observable properties that also need some special kind of validation. So say you're writing some kind of form that you want your user to fill in. Okay. And so if you go here into the analyzer nodes and expand here, put it over here. If I expand the observable property generator, you can see here there's a partial class that's the same as this one, this validation form widget view model. And so for each of my properties, the search generators are generating all of these boilerplate code for me. So they're creating the public property, and then they're, they have a setter, and then that setter will compare the value of the property, raise the events, invoke some additional method that also lets you hook into these events to like run custom logic if you want to, then they will update the field, they then they will validate the property, which will also notify the UI. And they basically do all of this for you for free. And you just don't have to care about any of this. And you just have literally just this attribute here and that's it. And you're all good right. to go. All right. I wanna just like everyone be in awe for a second that <laughs> that one line of code, line 29, <laughs> by doing that, when you just write that automatically all of that code is generated for you 100%, which Correct. is mind boggling. <laughs> yeah. And it's and optimized got... because like, you are writing that optimized code. Correct, yeah. There is a couple of uh, specific optimization that we can do, for instance. Like uh, in, traditionally, when you update a property and then have to raise the uh, property changed and property changing events, you would need to 
create a new instance of the event arguments. But the thing is that if you're always raising the same event for the same property, you can basically just reuse the same instance. And so, mm. for instance, this is one of the things that the generated code can do for you. So if you look here, when we raise the on property changing and on property changed events, instead of just creating the args, we're just accessing these generated properties. And if you expand oh. these classes here, you can see that the source generator is basically creating these classes where we just cache instances of all the uh, event args that we use in the entire application. And so we just pick them up and then reuse it all the time. So we also have less allocations over time. That is pretty cool because that is something that these small little things, you know, why source generators I think are cool is like when I try to write code, I'm going to forget to do that, right? Yeah. Like my library doesn't even do that, right? Because it's just right. like, here's a generic thing. And I didn't even know that this happened. And that's mind boggling, amazing. <laughs> and and this looks like scary code, right? But no one, like you're not supposed to edit this. This is generated. You don't touch this. Yep. And it's and it's this gobbly craziness because it all these globals is to make sure there's no conflict since it's there, Correct. right? Yeah, especially now that we have global using in C Sharp using global everywhere, make sure that even if the user has some kind of like global usings in their entire project, these types will always be the ones you expect. So this code will never cause a build error. Very cool. Now, now in there you show like, this is just a property, but I know some people they may have like, you know, for example, like this property also, you know, needs to notify that another property updated, let's say you have like first name, last name, and then full mm -hmm. name or something like that. Is that a possibility too with this thing? Yep, of course. So let's say we had a public property, full name, like you said, that just return first name. You can also see that the generated property does pop up in IntelliSense like you would expect. Which is cool. And then last name. Oops. Oh, if you wanted this property to also notify this, all you need to do is just add also notify change for, and then the name of that property, in this case, full name. And that's it. You're good to go. And if you go look at the generated code again, you can see that over here, uh, here, <laughs> we also have a second on property change, but this time for full name. Yeah. And it like it was generated just literally that fast. You know what I mean? Yes. Like it was nearly instantaneous. Yep, it's instantaneous, yeah. And also uh this new version, because we also published a first preview of all of this stuff in the 7.1.2 version of the MVBN toolkit. But this new version is has been completely rewritten from scratch using the new incremental generators in Roslyn, which are oh, even wow. faster because they are able to basically cache intermediate steps of the whole generation process so that your IDE doesn't slow down even if you're working on larger solutions. Like I'm also dog folding this in the Microsoft store itself, which is kind of <laughs> not, not super huge, but relatively large. And so yeah. I could definitely tell the difference when I switch to this new version that the IDE still remain perfectly smooth, even if you have all of these so source generators running all the time as you type. That's cool. That's really awesome. Now, what? Now we talked a little bit about required and min length and max length, but that's another thing called validators. I don't even know what that is. Like, what is this validator thing? Right. So basically, this observable validator class uh, provides mm. support for a type that's in the BCL, which is this I notify data error info. Never even which, heard of this. What? This is amazing. Right. <laughs> yeah, this is less known than, than just I notify property change. This interface is meant to support traditionally all the scenarios where you just want to build some kind of form uh, for the user to just fill in. And mm. so you might have a bunch of fields, and then each field might need some special validation. So for instance, here, we're just reusing some of these that just come from the BCL, but you can also uh, implement your own validation attribute with whatever logic you might need. And so here we have this field needs to be, this property needs to be required. This property uh, needs to have a minimum length of two, maximum length of, of 100. Here we also say this property needs to be an email address. And then this attribute will automatically run some regex to validate that. Wow. This property needs to be a phone number, for instance. And then if you try that out in the sample, here you can see that as a type, like, Sergio, I can uh, leave this invalid, and you can you will see that as a type, 
this icon pops up saying, hey, this property uh, needs to be at least with a length of two, or like this email address, if I type an invalid email address, it will tell me that this email is not a valid, a valid email address, which is wow. right. And how is that being triggered, like under the hood? This is basically all done uh, through the APIs that are uh, exposed by observable validator. So you can see here that in the generated code, right after we set the field, we also call this validate property. Whoa. We pass the new value of the property and then the name of the property. And then this calls an API that's from the BCL, which is validator. And that basically uses reflection to gather all the validation attributes on that target property for that type. And then it will basically invoke all the validation methods that are exposed from these attributes with the new value of the property. And then it will update the state depending on that. And so this is also something that the observer validator type exposes for you. So if you expand that, you can see that we have a property such as has errors, which you can bind to in your UI, for instance, to display like a, a an X or a check mark, depending yeah. on how the form is valid. You also can retrieve all these errors, or you can say, hey, just tell me the errors for this specific property, which is what mm -hmm. the UI is doing here. So if I over over here, we set the tooltip just to show the errors for this specific property. And instead, if I just click Submit, I will validate all of the properties, and then I will show this banner. And then if I click here, it will list me all the existing errors in the whole form. Oh, cool. That's really neat. Um, I need to do this because I get <laughs> questions about validation all the time. And I know that like in Blazor, for example, there's like are some built-in forms that have validation built in, but it seems like this can also, if you're doing anything in the world of XAML, now you're showing a Windows application, but this could be .NET MAUI, it could be Xamarin Forms, Absolutely. it could be WP, yep. it could be anything, right? That's yes. one thing here. It, it doesn't matter about what you're using. It's just giving you these helper methods and generators, right? Yeah, that's one of the advantages of uh, not using, not redefining your own types for this kind of logic, but just reusing types from the BCL. And is that many of the common frameworks that are out there just recognize all of these types and just support them naturally. So for instance, if you're on WPF, or WinUI, if you bind a property in a text box, the framework will automatically recognize that, hey, this target property is from a type that implements iNotify data error info. So let me also mm. hook into the events from that and then update the UI accordingly just for free. You don't have to do anything. Oh, cool. That's awesome. Okay. Now, before we move on to some high performance stuff and some other stuff, do you want to give a sneak peek at commands? Because I feel like commands go alongside properties, right? Commands sure. are for people who don't know in the MVVM world, it's like when you click that button, a command uh, sort of demonstrates uh, what method to call, basically, to, 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 to abstract that there. Correct. Yeah, so we have four types of commands in the MVVM toolkit. There are two synchronous ones, which are relay command and relay command of T, and then two asynchronous ones, which are I, uh, async relay command and async relay command of T. And so, like you said, the point of this is to abstract business logic from your view models into your UI. And not only that, but they also encapsulate also the logic to tell the UI whether or not you can actually execute this command. So for instance, if you have a button that binds to a command, like in this case, you don't need to also hook into events or anything to notify the button when it needs to be enabled or disabled. You can just throw the command at it, and it will just do that automatically. It will get the logic to update the visual state, and then when clicked, it will just invoke the logic behind the command. Got it. And so here you can see how that tradition is set up. So this would be in a world before source generators, right? So you would have a private method that uh, does whatever logic you want to do. So in this case, we're just incrementing a counter. And then we expose a command that wraps this method. And so you can see here in the constructor, I'm just creating a new instance of this command wrapping mm -hmm. that method. And so I have a sample here. As I click on this button, you can see the property is updated, and then the UI reflects that. And then you can basically either do this, or like you showed in your video as well, you can also now do this all through source generators. And so the way you would do that is that instead of defining the method and then defining the command and then initializing that, you can basically just say, uh, I'm basically already doing that here, actually. I have this private void method submit, right? And I'm saying, I want this to be a command. And so the second I apply this attribute, the source generator will automatically, if I expand this node here, submit. Yeah. You can see 
it creates a field of type relay command. And then it also creates a property that's public where it says either give me the command that has already been initialized and set to that field or create a new one. And the cool thing is that it also automatically recognizes the signature of the method. So in this case, the method is just void and takes a no parameter. So it knows, oh, okay, this needs to be a standard relay command. But if that command, if that method took uh, a parameter, then it would say, okay, this needs to be a relay command of T with that specific type. Or mm -hmm. if the method if the method was async task returning, then it would know, okay, I need an async relay command. So it would do all of that automatically. You just need to slap the attribute on it and it will just work. And parameters as well? Yes. So if I like add it here, string name, for instance, and then went to check into the generated code again, you can see that here now the attribute, the command is of type relay command of string. Amazing. And it's doing that automatically here. That's so cool that it just automatically, I don't know, it just does it. I know it's, <laughs> it's, it's so, I don't know, it's amazing. It's mind boggling and so cool. I, I love it. Ah, it's, it's so good. Now it, it also na renamed it, right? Cause your, your, your method is called submit and it appended command. So if you went into the XAML, it'd be submit command is what you bind to, correct? Yes, we have, um, we need to still write all the docs to document this, but we have a few um, standard renaming schemes that we apply throughout the whole uh, library. So for instance, okay. commands get command attached to them at the end. If they're async, we strip out the async and just append command. So if this was submit async, this would become submit command. Oh, cool. Uh, okay. and, and similarly for observable properties, um, we expect the name to be starting in lowercase. We also support uh, if you use like M underscore, if you come from the C++ world or just underscore lowercase, then we recognize all of those patterns and then rewrite them to have uh, the, the first character be an uppercase. Okay, very cool. I love it. Okay, so now we've made it pretty far in the video here. Now, some people may have gotten this wrong, like this is really cool, but I'm not even doing MVVM. I'm doing like server development. I want to, I was here for the high performance. I'm here for, for the diagnostic stuff. L let's get into that stuff, to be honest with you, because, <laughs> you know, I love MVVM. I, I come from a XAMLE world, but not everyone's doing that, right? People are writing right. <laughs> ASP.NET Core web apps or doing Blazor applications or doing all sorts of cool stuff. What are these two other libraries all about? Right. So let me start from the diagnostics package, I guess. I have a sample here. So this library contains a set of helpers to just do one simple thing, which is validate your arguments in your method. That's it. Okay. And so there are really just two APIs that are exposed from this package, which are guard and throw helper. The main one is guard, which is basically just a single entry point to do all your argument validation into your methods. And so if you expand the type, you can see we have a whole bunch of methods here. We have a whole bunch of methods like to check for uh, whether our argument is null, it's not null, has a given length, uh, uh, and stuff like that. So you can see here we have, uh, just to make a comparison, we have a sample method where we take a bunch of arguments and then we want to validate them in some way. So for instance, traditionally, this is how you would normally do this. You mm -hmm. would say, if the array is null, then we throw an argument null exception and we attach some command and then some text to it. That we want to check that the array doesn't have a length that's equal or greater than 10. So we check that and then we throw an argument exception. Then we have another different message. And then we also want to check that the index is in range for the array. And then we want to check that the span has a length that's lower than the array. And so we, we need to check a whole bunch of things. And you can see how the code gets pretty verbose really quickly. Yeah. And it's also error prone because an issue with all of these exception types is that the order of the parameter is not really consistent. So for instance, argument null exception takes the parameter name and then the message. But argument exception takes first the message and then the parameter name. And so it's pretty easy to get that wrong as yeah. you write things. And so what you can do instead is to just use guard. And all of that get just trimmed down to all this, and which is also much easier to read. So you can say, I want to guard that the array is not null. I want to guard that the, the array has a size less than. So it's really natural looking. So you just read and you know exactly what, you, what what is going on. Another cool thing that I haven't really shown here yet is that um, in the new version of the toolkit, we're also supporting C-sharp 10. And one of the cool new features is that 
there's this new attribute, which is color argument expression, which basically lets all of this API automatically get the name of the argument being passed here. And oh, so what wow. you can do is you, you can even just remove all of this. The compiler will insert that for you. Oh, wow. And so all of that becomes just check that this is not null. This is a size less than or than 10. This is in range for this array. Uh, this is a size less than whatever. And then this string is not null or empty. And that's it. That's cool. Now, in each of these methods and each of these guards, it throws the exception for you. Do you have control like not to throw an exception and do something else? Or is it always going to throw an exception no matter what? No, it's only checking and then throwing an exception. So basically, the benefits of this is that they make the code uh, less verbose and less error prone. They also give you better performance because due to the way they're implemented internally, they make it so the final code gen is in, in implemented in such a way that the all the code to create the, the exception type and throwing it is moved out of your method. So you get smaller method and save in binary size as well. Ah. And then also they give you easier to read and more helpful error messages. So instead of having to format all of these manually, you can see, uh, say, I wanted this check to fail. So I want to call this new version. And I want to say the index, for instance, is invalid. So I'm passing minus 2 here. And so when I run this code, this will throw an exception. Let me expand this window. If I scroll down, you can see that the message is the parameter called index, which is an int, must be in range. It gives you the previous value, the expected value, and it gives you a very detailed description of what went wrong. So you know yeah. exactly what happened. That's very cool. That's really cool. And I, in fact, if you're if anyone's coming from the Swift world, actually, they may know about guarding as well. It's a concept. I don't know what version of Swift it was introduced in. But I remember I was I was parsing some Swift code recently, and uh, and I, and I and I saw these guards, and I was like, I don't I don't understand what that was because it's a little bit different. Like it's usually you're 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 thinking you 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 already always have been guarding and like your 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 methods by yep. throwing these exceptions with this exception first. But this guard is sort of like, oh, it's almost become like an industry standard verb, I would say, <laughs> of like you're 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 guarding the rest of of the method from um, from any thing that might be invalid, basically. Yeah, and this is particularly useful for public APIs into your library, not just because they make it sure that you can rely better on the internal consistency of your code, but also because they can avoid getting into states where you're just in a corrupted state. Because you can imagine a method that just expects an argument. Instead of failing immediately, it will, it will just start doing something and then fail at some other point later on. And so you might be left there with some half of the work done and another half not done, which might be in an inconsistent state, which is hard to recover from or just outright impossible. And so just making sure that you fail as early as possible right at the start of the method is makes it much easier to just debug things later on. Very cool. Now, you said there's something else in this package as well, but beyond guard, you said there's some other like helpers in there? Yes, there's the throw helper uh, API, which is basically what the guard APIs are using internally, but just explicit. So the way it works is that there's this throw helper type, and then this exposes a whole bunch of APIs to throw all the common exception types. So argument exception, argument not null exception, and all that. And so the point of this is that for cases where you need explicit control of when to throw a given exception type or like uh, what exact message to include, you can use this one that still oh. give you better code gen because you're still not throwing, creating the exception and throwing it yourself, but you're letting the uh, JIT compiler move it out due to how it's implemented internally. This is the same pattern that the BCL is using internally, for instance. Oh, very cool. Awesome. All right. Last one. High performance. You kind of teased it at the beginning, <laughs> right. but um, I don't know who doesn't want high performance code. What that? What's that one all about? Right. So I have the docs for that over here. Actually, I'm not sure where they are. Here. So this package basically contains a whole set of APIs to do all things, like, like I mentioned, things such as pulling memory from the pool, from the array pool, uh, caching and reusing strings, and things like that. So we don't really have a sample for this, but we have a bunch of docs that you can check out here at dot, 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 docs.microsoft.com, or you can just browse the source code. So one of the common types that we have are uh, span owner and memory owner, which are basically wrappers around the array pool type from the BCL. So the point of this is that 
say you needed a temporary buffer to do some work. So what you would do traditionally is you would call a ray pool, rent a buffer, then get a span out of it, then do some work on it, and then finally return it to the buffer, which is kind of verbose and also relatively error prone because you might just forget mm. to return it in all code paths. So instead of doing this, you can just rewrite all of that to just do, hey, I'm using a spawn owner and I want to get this minimum length. And then from that, you get the span and go about your day. And then whenever this buffer goes out of scope, due to the fact that you're using a using statement here, this dispose method will just return the array to the pool automatically for you. So uh, cool. So it kind of implements all your iDisposable things for you so exactly. you don't forget. Yeah. Exactly. Another API that we have is uh, Span2D and Memory2D, which are two similar to Span and Memory from the BCL, but this time they're working in 2D space. So they can be particularly useful when you're working with images, image data, for instance. Say you're mm. interrupting with system drawing, and you need to get a bitmap, and then you lock it, and then you need to do some work on the raw pixel. It can, it can be a bit error prone because you need to account for like the distance between due to padding between each row. You need to account for the fact that you get a raw pointer and then you need to cast it to the right type. So, and also you need to manually do calculate all the offsets to iterate, for instance, columns or like a given mm. subsection. And so what you can do instead is to create a span 2D and that, that works exactly like a span. You can index it, is with the only difference being that you get two indices here because you're in 2D space. You can also slice it. You can get a reference to an item. You can get a span from a row. You can slice it in 2D so it will automatically internally keep track of the right offset so that you can say, I want to, for instance, cut out this frame area and just get mm -hmm. another span that wraps around this inner part. And then internally, it will know, OK, so I need to trim down this bit, so I need to calculate this offset, and it will do all of that automatically for you. And it also has a couple of helpers to efficiently iterate columns or rows by reference as well. So a, a huge number of APIs just to help in these kind of scenarios. That's really cool. So especially if you're doing like things like games or like you said, like a lot of like mathematical computation, yep. these could be really, really helpful. Yep, exactly. Uh, the last one I want to call out is the string pool type, which is basically a reusable pool for strings. So a scenario where this might be useful is imagine you're writing some kind of parser, right? And so you might receive as input a whole bunch of text you want to slice and find some bits that you need to extract, and then you need a string out of it, right? Because maybe the API that you need to call require a string, and they don't just ac accept a span. So the, the point of string is that they're immutable, so you can reuse it. But there isn't really an easy way to just get an existing string with that content when you need it. And so mm -hmm. this is where string pool comes in. So what it does is basically, you can use it like this. You can just do string pool.share.get or add. You pass it a span. And what it will do is will internally use that span as a key to find or create a new string efficiently with the same content and return mm. an existing instance if there not if there isn't. And we we run a bunch of benchmarks over this, and you can greatly reduce the amount of memory allocations in uh, scenarios where you're like heavily parsing and allocating new strings are you as you're processing data. Oh, that's very cool. Yeah, I can I can see any of these, especially when you're just really trying to fine tune your application and really get it super performant. These are like nice little things that you could uh, kind of optimize your code with. Yep. Awesome. Now, this thing is completely open source and people can contribute, correct? It is, yes. You can find it on GitHub, uh, communitytoolkit.net, uh, or there's also a short link, which is aka.ms slash toolkit slash .net, which okay. just redirects to here. All the code is open source over here. And you can find also links to the docs and your Contributions more, are more than welcome. So you can open issues, you can open uh, discussions, and you can propose APIs, you can report bugs. And if you have a new idea that, get, that gets approved, you can also go ahead and open up a, a PR. So like just like the Windows Community Toolkit has been all this time, where like this, 
this is kind of the whole point of the community toolkit is that it's a first party library. It's from Microsoft, maintained by Microsoft engineer. We're also using in first party applications, but it's specifically open towards the community. So it's a, it's a place where we really welcome people having a loop and helping out in any way they want, either just by reporting bugs or just proposing ideas and then just why not also go ahead and implementing them as well. Very cool. Sergio, this has been absolutely delightful and amazing. Um, I only got to like scratch the surface of what's inside of the newest version of this. I will put links to everything that we showed today and the blog post as well. Um, and as new features are added, you'll create some shorter videos probably with Sergio <laughs> and the team uh, to talk about what's coming new because every single .NET developer, you know, there's something for you in this amazing set of libraries. <laughs> Sounds like a good plan. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming on, Sergio. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you for having me. And thanks to everyone that's been tuning in. If you made it this far, honestly, thank you so much. <laughs> and of course, if you're on YouTube, jam that like button, hit that subscribe button, ring that notification bell. You know what to do. I really appreciate it. But until next time, thank you so much for watching. Leave your comments below. And that's going to do it for this week's on.net. So we'll see you next week. I'm James Montemagno, and thanks for watching. Mm -hmm.